This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is a true Memphis legend, professional wrestler, commentator, and artist, Jerry the King Lawler. Memphis is known as the Bluff City, but could also be called the City of Kings. Currently, the Grizzlies are trying to become the kings of the NBA, but to get a shot at the title and a likely meeting with King James in the Heat, they'll need to rally from a 2-0 hole in their Western Conference Championship Series against the Spurs. Later in the show, I'll sit down with Chip Crane from the Grizzlies blog Three Shades of Blue to get his thoughts on what the good guys need to do to get back in the series. Now, getting back to that City of Kings statement, think about it. There is Elvis, the king of rock and roll. There is Memphis Tiger Joe Jackson, the self-proclaimed king of Memphis. And there's also the legacy left by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose life came to an end in Memphis. And then there's the one and only Jerry the King Lawler. Lawler is a professional wrestling legend. He has seen it all and has been around from the sports grassroots days in the South to the colossal WWE WrestleMania shows watched by millions around the world. Last fall, while commentating on Monday Night Raw, Jerry suffered a heart attack and nearly lost his life. But in typical Lawler style, he was back on the air in a few months. And this Saturday, the 63-year-old will be back in the ring after being cleared by his physicians. Recently, I visited Jerry at his East Memphis home. We chewed the fat on a number of subjects. <laughs> Oh, my pleasure. It's great to have you here. In my home. Uh, in your home? In your throne? <laughs> I, yes. Let's go back to September, and um, obviously it, it, a startling moment for everybody um, involved in your life, and for you, obviously, to go through that. Uh, you look great. I know you said you feel great, but what do you remember from the heart attack? Well, you know what? It's, it's amazing still to this day when I, when I think about it. It's hard for me to fathom that that really happened because literally, and, and a lot of people go, oh yeah, whatever. But I mean, right. especially because like um, in, in my family, my dad had seven heart attacks in, in his life. Wow. And he, I mean, he felt bad in different ways preceding each one of those heart attacks of, you know, tingling in the arm or, uh, you know, tightness in the chest and all of that kind of stuff. I had none of that. I had nothing, none of the warning signs that always people talk about uh, you know, connected with heart attacks. I literally was on live television, worldwide television, doing the Monday Night Raw show, had just wrestled in a match in which when I go back and watch that match, it was like, gosh, I'm, you know, I was out there with, uh, I mean, uh, the WWE champion CM Punk at the time and Dolph Ziggler and Randy Orton, three of the young top studs in the WWE, and in there holding my own, had a great match, then came over, sat down and started doing commentary at the desk and literally, it was as if, I mean, I felt perfectly fine. It was as if I blinked my eyes, and when I opened them again, I was, my girlfriend was there. I was in a hospital room in Montreal, Canada, with a ventilator down my throat. And, I mean, I was, I was as shocked as anyone. I was like, I told my girlfriend, you know, like, what happened? Where am I? And mm -hmm. that's when, you know, she told me you'd had a heart attack. And you, uh, you made a miraculous recovery. I mean, you were back in, in no time at your job at Raw? Well, um, a couple of months, was yeah, it? Yeah, a couple of months. I mean, I was in the hospital there for five days. But as I said, it's, if, you, if, if I didn't know it happened, there's no way you could convince me that I had a heart attack because I didn't feel bad before. And I, haven't, I have not had one ill effect or have not felt bad since. I felt just the same ever since the heart attack as I did beforehand. We're so happy that, that everything worked out. <laughs> everybody tells me, hey, everybody tells me, it's good to see you. And I say, it's good to be seen. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This, this, I'm happy to be here. Well, we, we see all over the place, whether it be Monday Night Raw, around in Memphis, doing events all over the country. Uh, you opened up now at, at Win Automotive which is I-240 and Get Well, the Jerry Lawler Museum, and it is fabulous. You have everything in there, not only artifacts that have to do with your, your wrestling, but also your artwork. And, and there are some that may know about your love for art. 
Right. And where did that come from? And was that pre-wrestling? Well, first of all, it sounds a little weird to say you open up a museum inside a, a automobile dealership. Right. No, but it's and, really nice. And, the, and truly, the way that came about, um, back in December, I started, uh, I signed a little agreement with, with the people at Win Automotive to do some commercials for them. And that's basically uh, what, how this came about. I was over there the first time doing a commercial shoot, and the, the manager, Steve, there showed me around the place. And this used to be... Uh, it used to be the old Infinity of right. Memphis mm -hmm. dealership, which is a big, beautiful dealership. I mean, it's huge. And there were, there were parts of this uh, showroom in the back that originally had been set up to display uh, all of this merchandise and stuff for the Infinity uh, brand of, of cars. And, and they were just not using this, this room. And, and uh, Steve said, hey, you know what? Why don't you look at all this space we have here. If you want to bring some of your memorabilia over here and just kind of have it on display, uh, we, we'd love to have it. It would fill up the space, you know. So that's how it got started. And it just one thing led to another, and it snowballed, as did my collection of right. uh, memorabilia here. Uh, I had so much stuff. I mean, like, you know, old championship belts, my AWA heavyweight, world heavyweight championship belt that I won back in 88, the unified heavyweight championship belt that I won from Kerry Von Erich in, in Chicago back in the 80s, and then uh, the old Southern heavyweight championship, my WWE Hall of Fame ring, all, tons of my robes and different things that I've worn, and just all sorts of, uh, of memorabilia from my career. And suddenly, we looked around and we said, this is like a museum. Exactly. And so that's, that's how it came about. And it is that. And, and, um, and then we added, like you said, the aspect of an art gallery. Right. I got about 100 pieces of my artwork there. So all in all now, I, I, I just came from, I just came from uh, lunch and again, I walk into this restaurant and the guy said, hey, I was just in your museum. I spent about 45 minutes in there yesterday. And so it's like, it's really turned out to be something that I'm really proud of. And it's absolutely free. Anybody can go right. open nine to five every day except Sunday. So go by and check it out. And very briefly about your history with, with, with drawing and illustrations, was that, did that predate wrestling? And is that what you wanted to get into originally? It did. Um, I mean, that goes back as long as I can remember. I, I think around five years old, I can remember drawing oh, uh, wow. Superman. Okay. And there you see, I've got, I've got this huge uh, uh, section of Superman memorabilia that I've collected over the years. And, um, and, and all, th all throughout school, growing up and everything, I'd envisioned someday being uh, some sort of commercial artist. And what I really had in the back of my mind, I would have loved to illustrate comic books and do Superman uh, and Batman comics for DC Comics. And then um, uh, I, I would draw through school to be drawing when I should have been doing my homework. I didn't, <laughs> didn't make great, great grades in school because of art all the time. But uh, in the long run, run, it panned out because I did wind up... Um, this was in, I graduated in 1967 from Treadwell High School, and at that time, my parents didn't have the money to send me to, to college or anything, and it was the height of the Vietnam War, and mm -hmm. I was probably, I, as a matter of fact, did get drafted, and I, I was looking at, you know, probably heading right overseas, right. and instead I won a full tuition commercial art scholarship, thanks to my art teacher, Helen Stahl, my high school art teacher, took a portfolio of my work and submitted it to to at that time, of course, Memphis State, I won a full tuition commercial art scholarship How about that? and got to started going to college to be an artist. And that's where, at that time, uh, my dad was always a wrestling fan. And of course, the mm -hmm. matches were at the old Ellis Auditorium on Monday nights. And he and I would go down to, uh, uh, to the Ellis Auditorium and watch the matches on Monday. And somehow I started drawing some caricatures of the wrestlers and cartoons of the wrestlers. And one day, just on a lark, I, I thought, you know what? I'll, I'll, sent some of these drawings into Channel 13, which is where the wrestling was on at the time, and Lance Russell and Dave Brown were doing sure. the show. And so I just put together eight or ten drawings of Jackie Fargo and Tojo Yamamoto and the Blue Infernos and these guys that I was watching every Monday night, <clears throat> sent them over to the TV station. I just put Lance Russell, you know, wrestling show, and, and at, what was it, 485 South Highland, I think. And so I sent them in. And so the next Saturday morning, I turned on the TV, to watch, to watch Saturday morning wrestling. And all of a sudden here's Lance and Dave sitting at the desk and they're welcoming everybody to the show. And I looked on the, on the, on the screen there and there was my artwork. There were my drawings sitting on the desk right there, you know? And I thought, oh my gosh, they're gonna show them. And sure enough, later on in the show, uh, Lance and Dave said, 
Well, let's talk about what happened last Monday night down at the auditorium. And you know what? Uh, we have some artwork here from a young fan named Jerry Lawler. And this is sort of what happened. Look, here's Tojo Yamamoto. He fought Jackie Fargo in the main event. And I had a picture of like Tojo chopping Jackie Fargo and Fargo like splitting in half like a piece of oak wood or something like that, you know? And so, um, so it he, went they from, show my art. So it went from drawings and illustrations of the wrestlers to you actually being a wrestler and wrestling the guys that you, you drew. That's, which, how, which is that's how it happened. The art led me right into that. All right, let's go rapid fire here. Okay. How'd you get the nickname The King? Nickname The King came from um, finally wrestling in a match for the championship against the fabulous Jackie Fargo. Mm -hmm. And he was my mentor, so to speak, because when we go back to the drawing, I drew some pictures of Jackie Fargo. And then when I finally got to go over to Channel 13 to meet the wrestlers, Fargo came to me and he said, hey, kid, uh, me and Eddie Bond got this nightclub down on Madison Avenue called the Southern Frontier. I'd like to have you come over and draw some paint some pictures of me on the walls. So I thought, this is great. I'm meeting Jackie Fargo. I'm going to get to go and work for him, draw some pictures. And sure enough, what came out of that was a, a friendship and a company. They formed the Bond Fargo Sign Company, and I was doing all the work, and they would do the advertise for it. And that's why I, how I got to hang around Jackie Fargo and get to know him and watch him. And finally, he, he would let me go on trips with him to see him wrestle and things like that. And right. I just started bugging him. I just said, oh, my gosh, this is what I'd really like to do. No, kid, you're too good an artist. You don't want to get in wrestling. I said, if I could just try it one time, then I'll be happy. I'll go back to doing <laughs> art. I could just do it one time. Of course, finally, after me hounding him and driving him crazy, I got that one shot. He gave me, a, they let me do a match. And then, of course, I've been doing it ever since. But in about 1974, uh, I had this match with Jackie Fargo coming up. And just, just out, of, out of a whim, I went on TV and I said, uh, you know, Fargo, you've been the king of Memphis wrestling for a long time around here, but you're looking at the kid that's going to knock you off your throne. And I just said it just as a, you know, just as a whim. And so anyway, um, we had the match that Monday night and I won the match. You're the new king. And well, I just as I was wondering, I didn't even think anymore about that interview. But as, as I was going back to the dressing room, some kids were patting me on the shoulder and said, hey, you're the king. Now you're the king. <laughs> and so the following Friday, I was wrestling down in Atlanta, Georgia. We, I, would do, I would do Monday in Memphis, Tuesday in Louisville, Kentucky. Wednesday was Evansville, Indiana. Thursday, Lexington, Kentucky. And then Friday, I was going down to Atlanta and wrestling at the big uh, Kila, uh, not Kila, um, at the Omni in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So I go in the dressing room down there, and in walks this guy that was, that was named Bobby Shane, but he was wrestling. This was the first time I'd ever seen him. He was wrestling as King Bobby Shane. And he pulls out this beautiful crown and this big, long red robe, and he hangs it up. And I see that, and I go, wow. So I said, hey, Bobby. I we told him the story. The time, right? I, said, <laughs> I said, you know, I just, I just did this uh, interview last week, and, and where did you get the crown and robe? I said, because if I showed up, uh, you know, on television with that uh, crown and a robe, I could really, that would really be a hoot, you know. And he told me where he got it, and he told me how to order it. And he said, but you know what? He said, I'm leaving tomorrow on a tour, on a four-week tour of Australia. Uh, and he said, I'm not, I'm not wrestling as a king down there. He said, I'm just going as Bobby Shane, mainly because I don't want to lug all this stuff <clears throat> with me to Australia. He said, so why don't you take it, hang on to it, and uh, order your own stuff, and then in four weeks, I'll get it back from you. you know? So the next, that just worked out perfectly because then I took it with me that night. The following morning, I showed up on Memphis TV with the crown, the robe, and the then rest is I became the king. But a little piece of that history that uh, some people don't know about was four weeks later when Bobby Shane got back from Australia, I'm planning on seeing him the following week in, uh, in, in Atlanta to give him his crown and robe back. His first week back, he got killed in a plane crash. Oh, my gosh. And down to Tampa, Florida, killed in a plane crash. And so I was left with that crown and that robe. And uh, I, I wish I still had it to this day. I don't. But, uh, but that's how... That's how that uh, whole King thing got started. Well, we could sit here and talk forever. I know I can ask you <laughs> questions, so we'll try to hear in the last final minute. I'll try to make it a lot answers. shorter. Well, no, it's, they're great <laughs> stories. That's the um, toughest guy in the, in the ring for you. Toughest opponent. Give me a name. Early on, Jackie Fargo, without a doubt. And okay. then Tojo Yamamoto. Then later on, probably Terry Funk. You're, you, you just talked about Fargo. And Joe LaDuke. Oh, okay. my gosh. I just, there's, all so, these there's so many. So many. Is there... Uh, I'm sure you're close to a lot of wrestlers. Who are you closest to? You know what? The funny thing is uh, uh, people think that, 
But usually, uh, wrestlers, their their closest you go, friends you go your own are outside of the business. Yeah, you go your own way. You know, I mean, like for the longest time, I was the only wrestler that really, literally lived in Memphis. They, their guys are from all over the country. You know, Jackie Fargo. Uh, Jackie Fargo probably became my closest friend for a long time. Another one of my closest friends was Jerry Calhoun, who was our referee. Okay. Uh, and, and he lived here in Memphis, and he was probably uh, one of my closest friends. Is, is there a wrestler that you still? Um can't stand today. I mean, a guy that, you know, in the ring, just, you just, you, you want to throw out a name of a guy that just, man, he got under your, under your skin. Oh my goodness. Probably a guy that started here in Memphis and I wound up punching him. I got so mad at him in Louisville, Kentucky that I punched him and broke his jaw. And then, um, and now he's, he took my place when I quit in WWE about 10 years ago as a commentator. And then when I came back, they drug him cream, screaming and kicking off the set. And he and I have never really liked each other at all. And he's back in the WWE What's now. his name? Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman. Not a wrestler, but he's the manager of Brock Lesnar right now and the mm -hmm. manager of, of uh, CM Punk. But right. he and I have never been on the same page. How was it, uh, and again, this uh, has to be brief, but how was it to play yourself in, in Man on the Moon, and what was your relationship like with Kaufman? Well, that was quite a stretch, as you can imagine. Playing <laughs> no, it, but believe it or not, I had to go and audition for the part. Uh, they, really? <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, you know, I, I think because they were, they were trying to, um, they were trying to, actually, they had almost everybody that was really in Andy Kaufman's life came back and played either themselves or were a part of that movie. But I think they were concerned with the fact about the age. They thought that, you know, maybe I would look too old or whatever to right. do the wrestling scenes and everything. You. But then when, when they saw me, it was cool. It was, everything was great. And, um, it, it was a great time, but it was really a, one of the most memorable parts of my career. Working with Jim Carrey, who was playing the part of Andy Kaufman was totally opposite of actually working with Andy. Andy was the greatest guy you ever want to meet. I mean, he was down to earth, humble, no drugs, no drinking, none of that kind of stuff. And just, uh, just an all around good guy and loved and respected the wrestling business. And so he and I working together, was, it was like magical. I mean, still to this day, the, the, the deal we did with uh, Andy and I on the David Letterman mm -hmm. show is in the National Ra Museum of Radio and Television History in Washington. It's one of the top 100 moments in the history of television. <laughs> right. So uh, it doesn't and, and, get old. Yeah, and the stuff we did here at the Mid South Coliseum, maybe one of the most famous wrestling matches of all time. Here it's only you know it's 30 years later, and people still talk about it all all the time. So working with Andy was great. Working with Jim Carrey, eh. <laughs> we'll leave it like that. Yeah. All right. Five for the row. We always end our interviews with five quick questions and just quick answers. First thing that comes to your mind. Uh oh, um, that could be dangerous. I may me. know the answer to this though. F favorite professional sports team with your Cleveland background? Uh, Cleveland Indians and Cleveland Browns. It's okay. a tie. Favorite pro athlete of all time? Jim Brown. Favorite musician or music or artist or group? The Beatles. You got it. I love the Beatles. Favorite movie of all time? You can't say Man on the Moon. Christmas Story. Christmas Story. <laughs> you watch it every Christmas. It runs oh, continuously it. I, on I, TV. I watch it even right? when it's not Christmas. Uh, favorite TV series of all time? Television series? Superman. The Superman. old original Superman with George Reeves. Yes. Jerry, an absolute pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much. The Memphis Grizzlies are having a season to remember. They have won two playoff series this postseason and advanced to the Western Conference Championship Series for the first time in team history. That's the good news. The bad news is they trail the San Antonio Spurs two games to none in their best of seven series as the scene now shifts to FedEx Forum for Game 3 Saturday night and Game 4 Monday evening. After getting torched in Game 1, the Grizzlies rallied from 18 down in Game 2 to force overtime, but came up a bit short, losing 93-89. to now, despite the loss, the impressive rally may be enough to kickstart the team, who up until that point had basically been lethargic. Chip Crane is the co-founder and a contributor to the Grizzlies blog, Three Shades of Blue. He joins me now to look at what's gone wrong and what the Grizzlies need to do to get back in the series. Chip, are you still optimistic? You and I both picked the Grizzlies to win this thing in six. I cautiously optimistic has been my code word for every series, and I think I'm cautiously optimistic after game two. What did they do in the fourth quarter, rallying back from 18 down, 
that makes you think they can come back and get into this series? For the most part, they played their offense again. They got into their shots. They planted their feet. They did the things that an experienced team will do, whereas earlier in that game and in game one, they were rushing their shots. They were taking shots that were out of their flow of their offense. They seemed to be the immature team versus the old pros. Defensively, they did a lot of things better in game two. They did guard the perimeter better, although the Spurs still got nine threes, mm -hmm. but not the 14 they got in game number one. Tony Parker is a pain in the you-know-what. He gets into the side of the lane. He gets to the hole. What do the Grizzlies need to do to shore up their defense better for the rest of the series? I think they need to continue to do what they did in game two. You go into overtime and hold a team below 100 points, you're doing something right defensively. Uh, obviously, the outcome wasn't what we wanted, but I don't think they need to radically change what they're doing defensively. They just need to keep working at it, focus on what they do right. Uh, also, the Spurs shot an incredibly high percentage for the first six quarters. They came back to, down to earth in the second half, and I think that's going to be more like what they're going to be doing here in Memphis. They're not going to shoot 60% for a half in Memphis if we have any chance of winning. Offensively, we saw some signs of life from Zebo in that fourth quarter of game number two. It's still been very tough for Zebo. What can the Grizzlies do offensively? To, to get him the ball in better position, for him to be more demonstrative, to demand the ball, and also get Marcus Gasol going as well. If not, you're relying on a bunch of shooters that really, let's be honest with you, are inconsistent. Well, the first thing we need to do is get other people into the lane with the ball. I think uh, one of the things that made the team successful during the season and especially in the playoff run has been Conley being able to break down his defender, get into the lane, and force people to make moves away from our bigs. And if he can, he can start bringing that double team or even more on him, it's going to make it a lot easier for our bigs. Once they get in the groove, they generally stay in it for a long period of time. It's very difficult, especially for Mark, but also for Zach, to just go, here's the ball, create something. That's not in their nature, really. They're, they're more playing off people and taking advantage of when other teams are making the moves around for other players. So it really falls on Conley's shoulder. I thought the Grizzlies got away from the physicality that we're used to seeing from this team, the grit and grind, especially in game one, part of game two. I thought they got it back in the second half of game number two, played more physical. They wore down the Spurs a bit. Unfortunately, Tim Duncan gets the fifth foul and he gets some rest and he's fresh in the overtime session. But it was more Grizzlies basketball. I would expect from here on out, we'll see that physicality in the rest of the series. One of the, one of the keys to the series, in my opinion, has been to get Tiago Splitter in foul trouble. We have not, they have not succeeded in doing that. And until the Grizzlies are able to get either Duncan or Splitter to sit a large period of time and they normally are on the court and put them on the bench because of foul trouble, the team's going to struggle. It really is their backup big men are not nearly the level of players that their starters are. We need to get those guys off. Duncan's probably not going to get the rest calls, so you need to count on Splitter, who's had a history of foul trouble anyway to get him in foul trouble, and you need to attack him into the body to do that. The most successful offense we've seen from the Grizzlies is with Pondexter and Bayless on the court. I would suspect we'll see more of that. Oh, I, I definitely think that we need to spread the court and that Pondexter and Bayless do a much better job of that than Prince and Allen do. Uh, one thing I was shocked as they were showing the game Tuesday night was that it seemed to me that Kawhi Leonard never left the paint. He just stood there under the basket and was ready to double whoever, whichever big man came his way. If they are going to continue to get away with that, then we need guys hitting from the outside. If one thing we, we've learned about the Grizzlies and the Spurs this season and, and past seasons, you get the home court, you have a pretty solid advantage. Now it comes back to the grindhouse for, uh, Saturday and Monday. Do you expect the Grizzlies to even the series? Yes. Otherwise, my prediction looks very bad. <laughs> um, you now, can always change it, Chip. The Grizzlies are one of the few teams that have not lost a home game yet. In fact, I think they're the only remaining team that hasn't lost at home. The crowd obviously has a huge impact on that. We are a college crowd being introduced to a pro game, and we bring the college excitement to the game. Uh, we need to bring that excitement more than ever now. We need to help the team as much as we can as fans, but Home court advantage and the fans only goes as far as what you do on the court. Exactly. And I think they'll play off the crowd. They've done it all season long. I think that'll continue. Chip, always a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for stopping by.
A couple of Memphis Tigers basketball notes to close out today's show. Josh Pastner has filled one of his assistant coaching vacancies by hiring Memphis native Robert Kirby to the staff. Kirby is a tireless recruiter and has been on some tremendous staffs, including 16 years at Mississippi State under first Richard Williams and then Rick Stansbury. He coached two years at Georgetown under John Thompson III and last year at LSU under former Memphis Tigers head coach Johnny Jones. And according to several reports, the Tigers will play Gonzaga at FedEx Forum and Oklahoma State in Stillwater this upcoming hoop season and then reverse the sights the following season. Also this year, the Tigers will play Florida in the Jimmy V Classic and participate in the Old Spice Classic, making for a challenging non-conference schedule to go along with what should be a formidable slate in their inaugural season in the American. And that'll put a wrap on this week's show. Check out any of our previous shows on our website at WKNO.org. Just click on KNO tonight. Have a great week. Go Grizzlies. And we'll see you next time.